Hello my fellow content seekers, I'm the Culture Crusader and today I'm reviewing The Witcher Season 3. And the more I watch, the more I'm starting to understand why Netflix split this season in two, releasing only the first five episodes, then making us wait for the final three. Clearly they were on a time crunch to get this show out before the end of June. Yeah, given the number of LG HD TVs in this season, it really wouldn't make sense to drop this in any month other than Pride. Unfortunately for Netflix though, the show has gone over about as well as the rest of Pride Month has for the Rainbow community. People are rejecting it in numbers greater than anyone could have possibly foreseen, and the ones who aren't rejecting it are just outright ignoring it. That was a dilemma I had to deal with when deciding whether or not to even bother reviewing this show. What hurts a show more? Loud, overpowering audience rejection? Or a deafening silence driven by complete apathy? I think apathy is worse, but I've already watched the show now, the damage is done, and I didn't go through all that pain for nothing, so I'm going to embrace the sunken cost fallacy and just persevere with my video anyway. Curious to see if I am met with overpowering audience rejection or complete apathy, only time will tell. After I reviewed episode 1, I fully intended on continuing to review every episode individually, but after seeing the remaining 4 episodes, I realized I just didn't care. I just don't want to devote all that effort to a show that has already wasted so much of my time, so instead I'm just going to be covering all of those episodes, episodes 2 to 5, in this one video. Last review I wasted a bunch of time doing a non-spoiler section, only to repeat myself during the spoiler section, so this time I'm just going to skip straight to spoilers, so you've been warned. But before I continue tying the noose around this show's neck, I do want to acknowledge one or two things that I enjoyed in this season. Geralt and Ciri. Yep, that's it. That's literally all I liked about this season. In my episode 1 review, I said I thought I still liked Yennefer, but honestly, I don't. It's not that I dislike her either, I just don't care. She doesn't feel remotely like the Yennefer I know from the game, and if I had to guess, I'd assume she also doesn't feel like the Yennefer the book fans know from the books, but someone would have to confirm that because I haven't read them. I thought I liked Triss again, but honestly, she's just so completely bland and boring and I'm just sick of waiting three whole seasons to see a single thing that makes me connect with her or care about her at all. I liked Vesemir, Geralt's old Witcher master, not to be confused with Vesemir, the Redanian king, but he isn't in this season, and if I'm honest, I can't even remember if he's still alive after last season, so that doesn't even really count. And I thought I liked Dijkstra for about two seconds until they turned him into a masochistic beta cuck. Now it turns my stomach to even say his name. What a despicable character assassination. This guy was never supposed to be a good guy or even a likeable guy, but he wasn't a weak little bitch who existed only to be led around on a leash by the writer's latest self-insert girl boss power fantasy, Philippa Eilhart. And speaking of Philippa, I was also kind of interested to see her since I remembered her from The Witcher 3. Never mind, she's a cold, power-hungry lesbian dominatrix who is insufferable in every moment she spends on screen. Can't remember whether or not that's accurate to the game, but either way, she was not a likeable character in this show. Which is kind of hilarious when you consider the fact that she was very clearly the writer's wish-fulfillment character who embodies all the immense power they themselves wish they had. And I was even kind of keen to see Radovid, right up until the moment he started making eyes at Yaskia like a lovesick liberal. Emperor Amir was probably one of the only other vaguely enjoyable things in this season, but only because we saw so little of him. If he spent more time on screen, I am confident they would have found a way to completely ruin him too. Wow, I really said I was going to focus on the good things first, then went straight into the bad things. So much for that, huh? It's like my fingers are just working all on their own, tying the slipknot around the show's neck even as I try to stay the execution. If I really dig deep though, I could also say I quite liked Robbie Amell's elven general character. That guy was based. Shame they ruined Kahir this season by making him turn on his friend and murder the one good elf in the entire show. And I actually can't remember Kahir that much. I thought I liked him in season 2, but I'd have to rewatch to be sure, and honestly I'd rather drink napalm. So then we really are essentially stuck on the only two things I liked about this show, Geralt and Ciri. The only parts of this show I truly enjoyed were the scenes which depict their interactions in the wholesome father-daughter dynamic that I love so much. I would have really liked to see more of it, which is, I suspect, exactly why they gave us so little. You know, keep the audience begging for scraps, interlace just enough of what the fans want in amongst the toxic sludge of bad writing, boring characters, and a gender-driven dialogue. Give us just enough of Geralt and Ciri together that you might just get lucky enough to trick some of your original audience to jump on board for one last ride. Shame that small remaining minority of fans don't know this train is heading straight for a ravine and the showrunners have blown up the bridge just for the power trip of dancing over the wreckage of the franchise they killed. So, Geralt and Ciri. I think my favourite part of the entire season was when Ciri was being chased by the Wild Hunt and when they're about to catch her and she's terrified, alone, riding for her life, and they're gaining on her. 
And then Geralt shows up and saves her, casting Ard and driving off the Riders of the Wild Hunt. Once it's all safe, Ciri runs into Geralt's arms and he holds her, comforting her and protecting her. It's scenes like this which give us a tiny glimpse of what this show could have been if the writers weren't so focused on all the wrong things. Instead, they keep finding excuses to separate Geralt and Yen from Ciri again and again, and at this point I'm almost convinced they're only doing it to milk that emotion that the audience feels every time they see the characters reunited again on screen. Unfortunately, it gets old fast, and all it really ends up achieving is making Geralt and Yennefer look like really bad parents because they just keep prioritizing everything else over Ciri's protection. It just feels so contrived all the ways they find excuses to twist these characters into leaving Ciri or driving her away just so we can see them come back at just the right time to save the day. You know, even that scene I said I loved when Geralt comes in to save her. It's deus ex machina, and I'm sick of seeing that every two seconds in this show. Even in the mid-season finale, they leave her completely alone with just Yaskia for protection. Yaskia, who immediately decides he cares more about sneaking out to meet Radovid and reminding the audience why the show dropped in June than he does about Ciri's safety. Not that Yaskia would be any help anyway, which again goes back to the stupid contrivances that led Geralt and Yennefer to both leaving Ciri in the first place. Oh, but Yennefer left a protection spell on the house until morning. Ciri is perfectly safe. That is the most idiotic plot device I have ever heard. Are you really going to tell me that Yennefer knows a spell of protection that not one single other member of the Brotherhood of Sorcerers knows? That justification might work if it was only regular men who were after Ciri, but it's not. It's sorcerers. And not just any sorcerers. It's sorcerers so powerful they can create dark portals and corrupt Yen's own portals. The idea that these people wouldn't be able to undo any spell Yennefer can create is simply laughable, especially when Yennefer isn't even there to actively stop them. So basically, the only thing that's good about this show feels like it's being intentionally withheld from us and then drip fed just enough to keep us watching long enough to be, I don't know, converted by the sheer volume of diversity being burned into our retinas like a flamethrower to the face? So Yaskia, as I said, leaves Siri alone to break character and hook up with Radovid because the writers couldn't possibly comprehend the idea of a supposed good guy character putting someone else's interests above his own. Seriously, in that one moment, you just completely ruined Yaskia's character. He's always had his own self-interests before, but he was always the kind of person who would choose to do the right thing over his own personal desires, even if he didn't want to. You know, he might complain about it, but the reason Geralt trusts him so much is because he has always made the right call in the end. But no, now he literally has one job to watch over Ciri, and for only one night, and yet suddenly he's so self-centered that he just abandons his post because of a crush he has on a prince? Sure, at first, he seems to only go out to see what the noise was, but once he knows it's Radovid, he has a choice. Protect the innocent child under his care, or neglect her to satisfy his base desires. And he chooses the latter. If that doesn't perfectly encapsulate Hollywood morality, I don't know what does. And I'd be saying the same thing if it was a woman that Yaskir abandoned Siri to sleep with too. It's no secret that I'm tired of the alphabet agenda being shoved in my face in every modern movie and TV show, and this show is worse than most. But the problem here is not related to the character's sexuality, it's his staggering selfishness. Oh, but Yennefer put a protective spell on the building so it's fine. I already addressed that, but that's not even the only issue. Even if nothing happens to Ciri and no one gets into the building, she's been told Yaskia's gonna be there all night to look out for her. If she wakes up and he's nowhere to be found, she's going to be afraid, she's going to feel abandoned, again, and she might even do something dangerous like venture out of the house to look for him. And then if that does happen, what if Radovid sees her? But that's not even the worst of it. Yaskia tells Radovid, I can't take you inside because of the spell. Meaning, the absolutely brain-dead bundle of self-centered hedonism wanted to invite Radovid into the same house where Siri, a child, is sleeping to hook up with him right there. Okay, in fairness, Siri isn't really a child anymore, but she's still very much being portrayed as young and innocent, and I'm sure you can see how messed up Yaskia's intentions are if you follow them through to their logical conclusion based on his own words. And if you can't see that, you're probably part of the reason why people have started to refer to June as groom. But forget the morality of that for a minute and just consider the fact that Redania is one of the primary forces searching for Ciri right now. Radovid is the Prince of Redania, who has specifically been assigned to help Dijkstra and Philippa find and retrieve Ciri so that his twisted evil brother can marry her. And Yaskia wanted to invite him into the house where Ciri is sleeping. At that point, it almost passes simple selfishness and becomes malevolence. I cannot comprehend how this massive issue did not even occur to anybody in the writer's room. I'm almost speechless at the magnitude of that failing, and yet the Writers Guild still have the audacity to go on strike and demand more money for this kind of work? Like, are you serious? 
Anyway, don't think that Geralt and Yennefer are getting a pass on this either. They're barely any better than Yaskia. After all, Ciri is the closest thing to a daughter that either of them will ever have, and they both just left her behind under the protection of some useless spell and an even more useless bard. And look, I get it, Yennefer needed to go to this big ball thing at Aratusa, and maybe she even needed Geralt's help to figure out what all the other mages were up to. But after they think it's all over, they too decide to pursue their own desires instead of returning to protect Ciri. This whole thing hinges so heavily on that one spell that Yennefer put on the cabin before they left Ciri. But you need to justify something like that in order for the audience to actually buy your explanation. And I just don't see any reason why I should believe that no mage would be able to undo Yennefer's work. And even if I did, I also don't see any reason why I should believe these characters never once considered the possibility that Ciri might leave the cabin for some reason on her own. I guess what I'm saying is, I get that there are some situations in which they really might have to leave her to solve the issues that are causing all the threats to her in the first place, but the moment they think they've completed those goals, they should be returning to protect her again, not leaving her with some unreliable minstrel. And even if you argue that they thought they had solved her issues by getting Stregobor locked up, that still doesn't justify it, because they know Redania is after her, they know Reance is still out there, they know the elves are after her, not to mention Nilfgaard. It's just the most poorly thought out thing ever. But anyway, there's a few other minor critiques that I actually genuinely can't tell whether they're just me or if it's the show. So firstly, the lesser of the two. I was watching this show with Bluetooth earphones, which had a tiny bit of lag between the audio and video, so I'm not completely confident in this, but I feel like there were multiple lines throughout this season which were clearly dubbed. Like, most of the show was easy to follow, even with that faint audio lag, but then sometimes out of nowhere there would just be a whole elaborate line where the actor's lips barely moved at all and the number of syllables didn't even seem to match up. Obviously, an easy way for me to test this would be to watch those scenes without earphones, to, just to rule out the possibility of Bluetooth lag causing the disconnect, but honestly, I can't be bothered. So there's also an issue with the plot. Now, I can't tell if I was just so uninvested that I didn't take in any of it, or if it was genuinely really hard to follow. Like, Everyone criticized season one for having a really hard to follow plot with all the timeline differences and things, but I honestly found this far more like confusing. I was far more lost during this season than the first season. Pretty much nothing any of the characters did seemed to follow any logic as far as I could tell. Every time Geralt and Yennefer went to do something, all I could really think was, wait, why are we here again? And what are we doing? Like, I'll admit it's entirely possible. I just wasn't paying attention because this show is far from riveting. But I really felt like I was just constantly trying to piece things together from like poorly stitched together scraps of scenes. It was like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle with only half the pieces. Why did the elves show up at the fight at the end of episode one? I don't know, she's like their chosen one or something, but their scenes were so boring that I just zoned out too much to even pick that up on first watch. How did Geralt end up fighting some random hideous amalgamation of three women's bodies in a cave somewhere? I guess he apparently went looking for the mage whose hands he broke, but that scene with those two ultra cringe private detectives and their cat, where he found out about that, about where the mage was, that, was, that scene was so boring that yet again, I just zoned out. And so when he gets there, I'm like, wait, how do we get here? I don't know, whatever, who cares? I guess they're here now. And so I'll readily admit this zoning out thing is my problem. But it's also the show's problem when they write scenes and characters so boring that they can't hold my attention even when Geralt is in the scene. So, you know, I end up just sitting back watching Geralt slay a monster in a cave thinking, cool, he's doing Witcher things, but I have no idea how he got here, and honestly, I couldn't care less. Then somehow we end up at Yennefer's old home, because I guess Ciri just happened to accuse her of being born with all the beauty and power in the world right when they happened to be within walking distance of Yennefer's old home. Either that or Yennefer took Ciri on a multi-day sidetrack just to prove a point, which is also possible given how inconsistent this show's timeline is. And then... In that cave where Geralt slays the amalgamation, for some reason we come across a fake Ciri, because I guess the mystery sorcerer has been experimenting with implanting fake memories and altering someone's identity. Now this might make sense if the intention was to use the fake Ciri for some kind of power play, you know, you could sell her to the King of Redania, or you could return her to the Emperor of Nilfgaard, or you could use her to play them both against each other, or you could like have her be seen and talking about being Ciri and have everyone think she's Ciri and then you could kill her and make everyone believe Ciri's dead while you then get Ciri for yourself and keep her, which might have been the plan, but you know, there's plenty of ways that you could use a fake Ciri to stir up trouble in the continent. But Based on what the show tells us, that doesn't seem to be the intention at all. Instead, Geralt says repeatedly that they were practicing, they must have been practicing, this girl was just a test subject to refine the spell they intended to eventually use on Ciri. 
So if the only goal is to make a spell which can implant memories in Siri's head and alter her sense of identity, why make the test subject think she is Siri? It's just such a random path for an evil mage to take in his experimentation, and I don't understand the logic behind it. It felt like it was really only included just to get that little cliffhanger at the end of episode two with her saying, I'm Siri, and then also just to generally confuse the audience. Like, it wasn't necessary at all. And then for some even stranger reason, that one girl is the only one of the four of them in the cave that actually had memories implanted and all of that. Geralt keeps saying she's the only one that survived the experimentation. Yet, as far as we know, she's also the only one who even underwent the experimentation at all. The other three were also victims of twisted magical experimentation, but in a very different way. Their heads were grafted into this weird nerve cluster thing in the wall using the worst CGI I've ever seen, and that's coming from someone who never notices bad CGI. While their bodies were twisted together to form some kind of hideous monster that Geralt has to kill, while the heads beg him for help and shout creepy things at him. That is not the same experiment that fake Siri underwent. Or if it is, it clearly went horrifically wrong. Like, that isn't even in within the vicinity of what they were trying to do. But then, after Geralt has killed that amalgamation, he suddenly starts caring for not Siri almost more than he cares for yes Siri. Like, I like that he cares for this innocent girl and you know, wants to help her. But how exactly the plot progresses from there to some random cabin in the woods with an old friend of his mother's, I have no idea. I mean, if I really try to think back and piece it together and guess, I suppose it's probably explained away by him saying that there's only one person who can find out who did this to this girl. But I'm not buying it. Like, again, I'm just not. You could take her to Yennefer. You could take her to Trist, to Saya, any of the other mages that you're familiar with. I mean, Geralt's familiar with a lot of them. And honestly, in fact, it would probably be a good idea to take her to those people so that the good mages within the Brotherhood have some idea of the kind of power that's out there hunting Ciri. Instead, we go seek out this random old mage who even more randomly lives with a werewolf who Geralt supposedly knows from the past, a story beat that has literally no relevance to anything whatsoever. Maybe it's a reference to the books, I don't know. And as far as I can tell, this whole scene was just orchestrated so that Geralt could reminisce about his mother who left him on the side of the road when he was a child. This old mage was friends with his mother, after all, and now she tells Geralt that his mother has since died, and the whole thing is just a needless diversion from the main plot, and not the only one in this season. And it just really feels like they had a bunch of bullet-pointed scenes that they wanted to hit, and they did not care how they got from one to the next. Every justification for every action just feels so flimsy, undersold, illogical, or just outright unexplained. And it just goes on and on like this, where nothing really makes all that much sense if you think about it for more than a couple of seconds, and they just don't seem to care. Jennifer takes Siri to some random bank and says, I have things that need to be taken care of, and then just sends Siri out into the town with no more than a freaking banker's assistant as protection. A banker's assistant who, by the way, is just a boy who seemingly has no real combat skills, isn't overly brave, and they've never even met him before, so they have no reason to trust him. But no, Yennefer's just going to trust him with Ciri's life. Oh, but she cast a locating spell on Ciri's pendant so that they can find each other if they're in danger, you might say. A lot of good that did Ciri when the baby wyvern was trying to kill everyone, or later when she tried to summon Yennefer and weirdly summoned a bunch of other mages instead. And setting aside for a minute how dumb it is for Yennefer to just send her out into town with a stranger like that, we reach the next thing that just doesn't make sense and was not at all explained. So Ciri is found by some fat, nasty mage who randomly just assumes she's an escaped student from Aratusa based on literally zero evidence whatsoever, and she tries to take Ciri back with her. Yep, you heard that right. Mages might be able to tailor their faces to be as beautiful as they like. Hell, Yennefer even had her body altered too to get rid of her deformities. But I guess they can't do anything to reverse the effects of unrestrained gluttony. Makes sense, I guess, since clearly they don't have a spell for curing pride either based on Philippa's escapades with the human of indeterminate gender later on in the show. I wonder if the mages are just weak to all the seven deadly sins, or just the same ones that Hollywood is weak to. Anyway, the fat mage's appearance is the least of their problems. I have far bigger questions. Like, how did she find Siri? Why did she even pay her any attention at all? Why did she assume she's a student mage? She clearly didn't know who Siri was, so I just don't understand why she, Sabrina, and Tessaia, and Yennefer all happened to stumble upon Siri at the same time. Like, the locating spell explains why Yen showed up. Better late than never, I guess. But did the same spell attract the other three as well? 
because if any mage can intercept a locating spell, then it's pretty damn useless. And also, would Aratuza really mobilize three of their top mages to investigate a simple locating spell out in the city? Like, I just don't understand the logic of this scene. I guess to say I was with Yennefer, so she came with Yennefer, but still, where did Sabrina and the Fat Witch come from? So as I said, there's a lot I don't understand about why the plot goes the places it does, but I don't have time to list them all. Yennefer invites the other mages to a bathhouse, and for some reason they start treating Ciri like she's a cupbearer or something stupid, and the whole scene is just so insufferable. Sabrina is crass as hell, the fat mage is every bit as entitled as you would expect from someone who looks like they just ate the last cupbearer whole, and Yennefer just kind of goes along with it. Thankfully, it's revealed that we're supposed to dislike the other mages, and Yennefer dislikes them too, but she has to play nice because she needs their help. And then we get this line. Will you let her scrape out my insides to become vapid and power hungry like your friends out there? You want to be a great leader? You want to change the world? Well, guess what? The day-to-day -day of leading is dealing with a lot of vapid, power hungry assholes. Yeah, fun fact about this scene, it wasn't actually in the script. It was just Freya venting to Anya about how toxic it was to deal with the showrunners on set, those vapid, power hungry people. And Anya was telling her that that's all life is. Turns out the cameras were rolling the whole time and some editor decided to use that footage in the show. Kidding, obviously, but the way Yennefer just about sells her soul to get back in with the Brotherhood is awfully close to the way actors and celebrities have to grovel and apologize and beg for forgiveness before being allowed back into Hollywood after being convicted of wrongthink by the Twitter masses. I'd respect Yennefer a whole lot more if she just pulled a Gina Carano and said, screw you, I'm not apologizing, I stand by my actions, and if you don't like that, then that's your problem, not mine. And clearly Siri would respect her a whole lot more too, because she basically calls Yen a coward and says Geralt would never do this, then sneaks out and goes looking for Geralt again. And Yennefer, yet again, fails at her job of protecting Siri. Anyway, there's a heap of other stuff that I would have commented on if I was reviewing each of the episodes individually, but instead I'll just skip over all that and address one more massive issue I had with the mid-season finale, episode 5. So it was one of the most frustrating episodes of TV I have ever watched, or at least in a very long time, and for one simple reason, it's essentially the same 15 minute episode repeated three times just to fill out the full runtime. Seriously, this is an episode where we follow Geralt and Yennefer as they attend a ball at Arachusa. Then we cut to them talking about it afterwards. Then we cut back and see the exact same scenes again, but like extended editions where it shows us more of the conversations. So basically the show just wasted our time the first time showing us only half of each conversation just so they could waste our time again showing us the same conversations again but with more words spoken. And then if that wasn't enough, it does it a third time. The whole episode could have been a third as long if it didn't waste everybody's time in some pathetic attempt at mystery, tension and political intrigue, all of which it failed at by the way. Like, holy heck, tell us you have no respect for the audience's time without telling us you have no respect for the audience's time. Every time it cut back to a scene that I had already witnessed, it just made me more and more mad. And if I really think about it, this whole season has been a complete waste of time, and now it's only got three more episodes with Henry Cavill left to save the show. But there is no saving this show, because even if by some incomprehensible miracle, season 3 part 2 ends up being good, that's the last we'll ever see of Henry Cavill's Geralt of Rivia. And Henry's depiction of Geralt was really the only truly great thing about this show anyway. Liam Hemsworth is a decent actor, and in isolation I think he would make a pretty alright Geralt, but Henry was born for this role, and if not even he could save the franchise from the arrogant incompetence of the writers, I really don't know what hope Liam has. The franchise is dead, and the only sympathy I have to give is to Liam, who has just signed a contract shackling himself down to a sinking ship. Henry has moved on to bigger and better things, and I couldn't be more excited for his next project. While The Witcher is dying in his absence, he'll be out there building up a Warhammer cinematic universe, and I cannot wait. So those are my thoughts on The Witcher Season 3 Part 1. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk, and until next time, keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.